Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Raphael. Um, this is a long list of fantastic collaborators at DeepMind mostly. Um, I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited to uh, tell you about the, this work. I think it resonates with a lot of topics that have come up. I will, however, uh, improvise on the introduction because I'm going to skip one of the studies to bring us back on time. And um, it's going to create a couple of awkward transitions, but it's also going to save me one. So I think it's going to be worth it. Um, so we, I, social dilemmas, as we've discussed a lot, um, hide in every multi-agent setting. And it would be amazing if we had artificial agents that could help humans cooperate with one another. And um, these tensions between individual and collective incentives, you can't just solve them by becoming smarter. Uh, they, they get even more interesting and harder as uh, you and your fellow agents become smarter. Um, and one way to solve this is social norms. That's the one I'm going to skip, although I think it is the one why you invited me. So sorry about that. Um, <laughs> And it's also going to, the reason, uh, or the, the takeaway here is that I want to talk about what it gives you if you study these sorts of questions in the environment at the bottom, which is video games that are from pixels and you need a deep reinforcement learning agent to handle them. And you get a lot of cool concepts if you study uh, these questions and that, as opposed to matrix games where sort of the strategy of cooperate and effect, which are really hard and complex things, they're just predefined as like uh, two actions you can choose from. Um, so I'm going to skip this. Um, and the reason why that is an awkward transition is because in the next study, I am actually not going to use a 2D environment, but I am going to uh, make it a little bit simpler and study it in this environment that is more complicated than a matrix game, but it is still uh, a bit richer, that you have multiple actions on how much you want to contribute, and the, it's a little bit more of a complex game with many steps. And the reason why I think this, is, this whole direction is interesting, because we are using simulations to make all sorts of policy decisions about and study questions, like what to expect from the economy, how diseases spread, um, traffic, all of these are simulations. And there's, for example, this cool paper called The AI Economist, where they're trying to discover a tax policy from a richer 2D world simulation of an economy. That is obviously, it has four players and just very few things to do. It is much simpler than the real economy, but it is a richer simulation than many of the existing simulations that, that people currently use. And of course, all of these questions that I've mentioned, uh, like let's say the spread of diseases, uh, you care about human behavior, like uh, same for traffic and the economy. And the question is, how can you enrich these simulations to give you authentic and real uh, behavior of humans that is sort of plausible to how real humans would behave? Uh, Amir Desfoli and Peter Dayan have a cool paper where they use behavioral cloning to create recurrent neural networks that behave like humans in psychological tasks. And they do psychology experiments on these recurrent neural networks and they behave in those experiments like real humans would behave. Um, so the question that this poses is, can better models of humans can be part of these better simulations? Um, and both of these studies happen in parallel to the study that I'm going to show you, but they sort of combine these two ideas a little bit. Um, because one solution that people came up with to solve social dilemmas are uh, institutions or mechanisms that can support desirable group outcomes. For example, institutions can set uh, the incentives. Uh, let's say there's an institution that it sets your incentives that you drive on the right or the left, depending on which country you're in, but it's better for the group if you're consistent with everyone else. Um, mechanism design is a framework that designs these policies that takes into account that people act strategically. So for example, if I have a simple resource allocation problem, let's say I have a burrito and I want to give it to whomever of you is hungriest, and I just ask you, how hungry are you? Everybody who's a little bit hungry is incentivized to exaggerate how hungry they are because there's no cost to you to misreport your preference. But even me wanting to do something nice, uh, it's hard if you just ask people what they want. You might not, just, you might not get the right answer. 
What we want to do is we want to design a mechanism that leads to more desirable outcomes for humans who are exposed to a social dilemma. But the question is also, what is a desirable outcome? Um, this is a great book by Stuart Russell that I actually read after we designed the study, but it also aligns really nicely with what we wanted to do. And uh, it, it talks about this problem, how hard it is to communicate to a machine what humans want, especially if the machine is supposed to satisfy multiple people at the same time. That's like a really hard problem. Uh, what he's suggesting is these design principles of uh, the machine should realize human preferences. It should be uncertain about what those are initially, and it should learn them from human behavior. And this echoes what we want to do. We want to not assume how people act, and we do not want to assume what people should want from this mechanism that helps them cooperate. Um, if you were doing standard mechanism design, you could assume people are rational in how they maximize their own rewards, and the goal of the mechanism would be to just maximize the total welfare of the group. But we don't want to assume either of these things. Um, because people might not even want that. They might want something else, and they might behave in a really weird way. Um, so back to the environment. The reason why we choose this environment, which is not like a really complicated video game, is because we want to really understand what the agent has learned. So in order to, uh, so we chose something simpler, but then the benefit is we can really look at what the policy is that the agent has learned in a minute. So this is the game. Uh, it's a classic public goods game, if you know that, but like with a little bit more freedom which is there are four players, and they play an episode of 10 time steps, and they have an endowment. On each turn, they can give this endowment to the public fund in the middle. Everything that they keep private, they cash out and take home. Uh, and the endowments can be unequal. So one player, which we call the head player, always has 10 coins to give, and the other three players either all have two, or they all have six, or all have 10, and um, that never changes. Like, if you ever have two, you'll have two for all games for all um, time steps. Um, so just it, you can be the environment can be initiated to uh, to be very unequal. So people make their contributions on every turn. These contributions are summed, multiplied by 1.6, and then they are redistributed by the pool. In a standard public goods game, it's just divided by four, uh, which is a social dilemma. The more you give, the more you are exposed to other people exploiting you. But here, there's a policy that takes eight inputs, which is the four endowments, the four contributions, and the action is four numbers that add up to one, which is the redistribution policy of uh, who gets how much back. Uh, that's the game. Uh, this is what you see when you're a subject playing this online. You have your endowment coins at the top, then you decide do you want to put it in the group project or keep it in the private account to cash it out. And then you see uh, a full set of everything that happened on this time step. So everything is visible to everyone. First, the contributions. You gave two out of two. Player one also gave two, but they also kept uh, eight private. So here you can see that the endowments, how high these bars are, that shows you the initial inequality, uh, which is in this case quite high. Then uh, you can see the redistribution, which we frame this way that there's the sort of default, which is you just divide it by four. And then there is uh, the referee. So that's the policy that's, um, that's either our agent or baseline that is uh, taking actions to make adjustments. And here you can already see that player one, who kept eight, uh, eight coins private, is getting a lot less than you would expect. So it seems like the referee has an opinion on that. Uh, and then at the bottom, you see the payments, which is how much does everybody actually take home? Um, which is all the money that they kept private and all the money that they got back from the pool. So the sum of these bars is the surplus. So this is high. If everybody contributed a lot, then a lot of wealth was being generated. And the variance across it is the outcome inequality of how much people actually take home. In this case, although it's still unequal, it actually got less unequal than it initially was. So this uh, time step contributed a little bit to make the outcomes more equal. Uh, so this is just from the player perspective what happens in this game, but that's just one time step. People actually play four games. So first they get instructions and then they play one game without a referee where they just play this game as a standard public goods game. Uh, we call this policy strict egalitarian because it just gives the same outcome to everyone no matter what. And then you play two episodes with one with referee A and one with referee B and it's counterbalanced either our agent that we designed or it is a baseline. And then this is the important thing. Now people vote. 
And they say, and uh, so the vote is incentive compatible, which is it is more likely that you play one more round with um, the mechanism that was actually voted by majority. So because it's a binary choice and you, it actually affects how much money you take home, there's now no reason to misrepresent what you want. It is, would be very hard to be strategic here. So we just accept people are pretty honest about what they reveal, what they actually want to happen here. Um, and this vote is what our agent will try to maximize. That's the reward. Our agent will want to be popular with people in the actual vote. And I want to suggest that this is a fairly naturalistic setting because sort of real world institutions, countries, but also people, they do not fully specify their policy to you. You have to experience it and just like live with it for a bit and then make up your mind. And they also do not take a huge amount of feedback from you. Sometimes you get to vote, um, but even at a conference, I know you have a, one drink with one person, then you have a drink with another person. The next day you can decide again, do you want, you know, with whom do you want to have a drink with again? That's the setting. It's very sparse reward signal. Play two episodes, just get one signal from people. Um, and what we want to discover is, so what do people actually want from mechanisms in the setting? What do they find desirable? Can we find uh, a better mechanism just from this very simple uh, binary expression of preference? And how can we search this space effectively? Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, we want to use deep reinforcement learning for that. Uh, you probably know this picture of an agent playing video games, but uh, we want to replace the inputs with the endowments and the contributions. That's just these eight numbers are the inputs. The output is four numbers, uh, the redistribution actions, and the reward is the votes. And of course, uh, typically, I mean, that's, that's super sparse. If you imagine like um, you had like, I don't know, movie night and all that people tell you is like, oh, I like movie A more than movie B, it might take you a while to figure out what it is that people want. Um, so how can you get so much from so little? Uh, you typically need a lot of data. And how deep reinforcement learning agents solve this is like you can plug them into a video game and they can play it for as long as they want. So that's what we want too. We want a simulation, but the simulation needs to be faithful to human, to human behavior. That's the hard bit. So that's the challenge that we want to solve with this. Um, we gather a data set of 4,000 people playing this game against various mechanisms that we sort of came up with that we think are reasonable. And then we create behavioral clones of um, humans by having an LSTM just, uh, just learn to uh, act like humans act, uh, including the variants of uh, how people act. And so this is a this is what the data set looks like under one condition. So this is the episode people start on the first trial. They either give half or they give everything. And by the end of the episode, no one contributes anything. This is in the social dilemma uh, situation where there's no referee. So everybody starts to defect. And the LSTM, if you make four copies of it, have this LSTM play the other copies. You unroll a game. You unroll hundreds of games, thousands of games. That's like the data set you would then get, like the population. Uh, on a whole produces a similar pattern. So that's this step here. We create a model uh, with imitation learning. But that's not the critical thing. We don't want to like model what's there. What we want is an agent that learns a new policy, which means it has to explore uh, and try new things that aren't actually in the data set that uh, the LSTM was trained with. It, wants to, it needs to come up with new things uh, as it trains against a simulation populated with these behavioral clones. And as it tries these new things, these behavioral clones need to act like real humans would act under that same situation. So the generalization needs to basically uh, anticipate how humans would act under this new mechanism policy. And if that works, then this last step will work, which is that we take this agent out of the simulation, put it back on the internet, have it play against the baseline, and if, and then we want new people to say, yes, I prefer this policy over the baseline. Uh, then it, the generalization has worked. So it's sort of like sim to real, but with human. Um, this is the training pipeline. So as I said, you unroll two games with, you 
create four of your LSTMs, uh, unroll a game under, this is the strongest baseline we made. I'll explain that in a minute. But this is the strongest baseline, and we made our lives quite difficult because it's really strong. Uh, and you unroll a game under our agent, and then you simulate a vote, and how many votes you get, that's the reward that's flowing up here and is adjusting the network weights of the agent. That's a training pipeline. And the result is we do win. So this is uh, what that analysis looks like. We only care about the votes. That's what the reward was that we wanted to maximize. This is now our mechanism against what we call the libertarian baseline. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, we split it up for the tail players, so the players that have less money and the head players. And you see our agent is very popular with the tail players, uh, not so popular with the head players, but that's fine because there are three of them and we want to win the overall vote. And we do. Uh, but we don't just do this in one um, setting, but we do it in five different endowment conditions and against three different baselines. And we win in 13 and we draw on two. So overall, this works. Now, the that's already surprising, but of course the question is like, what has it learned? Like that's now, you know, how can you be good at this game? What is it that people actually want from you that they will vote for you? So, uh, so let's try to visualize these policies. Um, all of them at baselines and the agent are just like feed forward and they have no memory. So they just take the inputs of the current time step and just output these actions. So we can uh, plot the policy by this, uh, this is one time step and how much the head player contributed. So this is, they gave zero coins, this is, they gave 10 coins and we collapse the tail players to one player. So this is all the tail players contributed everything. This is none of the tail players contributed anything. This corner means everybody contributed everything. Uh, and then the color is how much did the players get from that policy. So libertarian just simply gives you back proportional to how much you contributed. The more you give, the more you get back. And that's why it has these nice straight lines. And it is yellow here, which is if the head player is the only one contributing, they are the only one getting anything back. It is dark blue if the tail players are the only ones making contribution. They get all of it. And uh, if everybody contributes everything, it's somewhat in the middle. As you can imagine, this actually does completely solve the social dilemma. Like if everybody's just incentivized to give everything all the time, uh, you do maximize the surplus, but it also preserves the initial inequality. Like it never redistributes any money. Um, liberal egalitarian is what we came up with to solve this problem. It's the same thing. It gives back people proportionally to what they gave, but it's normalized by how much they had. So if you give two out of two and someone else gives 10 out of 10, the mechanism says, that's great, you gave 100%, so I consider that to be equal. And that's why the lines are nice and straight, but the whole color scheme is shifted to blue. That means for the same coordinate, the tail players get more, just because their contributions are um, uh, increased. Uh, what this does is it still incentivizes contributions, but it also redistributes wealth. But it's not perfect because it can be that the head player is actually incentivized to defect now if too much money is being redistributed. Um, so now that you know these two baselines, which are already, I mean, this is the baseline you would come up with just from the standard economics literature, right? Because that just sets the incentives perfectly. This is already anticipating that there is a strong notion of fairness that people might care about. How can you do even better? This is what the agent comes up with. Uh, no more of these nice straight lines. Um, so first of all, the color scheme is exactly like liberal egalitarian. So like it's, it has very, it gives a similar amount to people. Uh, it obviously, it gives uh, extreme yellow and blue to the player if, if those are the only players who are contributing. So if the head player gives everything, they're the only ones getting anything. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting, so it does wealth redistribution. The other thing that it does is it really expands these corners where defectors are punished. So here, if you give a little bit more, you get a little bit more back. So it's sort of a linear relationship. This is a rectified linear relationship where it basically says, you get nothing until you give half, and then above this threshold, we will consider your contribution. So it is very harsh, but also interpretable. And that's what the agent came up with because people wanted that. Um, so this is how we can analyze how games uh, shake out overall, every dot here is a game. And on the y-axis, you have the wealth that was being created. So this is high if everybody contributes everything. And then the outcome inequalities on the x-axis, how much 
people actually took home. And as you can imagine, strict egalitarian is the one that, that creates a social dilemma and everybody gets the same outcome. There's a lot of mass on the left, which means the outcome's relatively equal, but there's not a lot of mass on the top, so not a lot of wealth was created. Libertarian that gives back proportionally creates a lot of mass at the top because everybody's incentivized to contribute a lot, but there's also a lot of mass on the right of games that turned out very unequal. Uh, our agent and liberal egalitarian are pretty good at pushing all the, all the dots in the top left corner of the games that turned out uh, equal and uh, prosperous. But what, what's interesting about that is the agent obviously didn't know that that's what the game is about. Like, obviously, you know that the game is about, uh, first of all, the, the trade-off between equality and uh, surplus, and also the conflict between a wealthy minority and a democratically uh, powerful majority. The agent doesn't know that. It doesn't know any of these things. It doesn't know these dimensions. The agent just knows makes the votes go up. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool that it did that. Maybe you don't think it's cool. Maybe you think the agent is bad because the baselines are bad. There are two harder baselines, conceptually harder, that should be doing pretty well. One is humans. Humans can take the role of the mechanism, play online, they get this interface, they see what happened on the trial, they decide who, might, who gets back how much. And the humans, uh, they have a lot more going on. They have, uh, they have memory. And they don't have to be impartial or deterministic like our agent uh, does. Our agent has no concept of treating player two differently than player three. Like if, if they give the same inputs, they have to receive the same outputs. But humans are not as popular as our agent. Uh, when you play an episode against the agent and an episode against humans, uh, the players on the internet really like our agent better. The other thing you might say is, do you need this whole thing with the behavioral cloning? And like that, that's a, a lot of work. Couldn't you just create a simulation where uh, the, the virtual players are just maximizing their reward in a pretty straightforward way, and wouldn't that give you most of what's going on in this game? And we did that, so we just created bots that are optimal learners that sort of figure out if they're in a social dilemma or not, and if they are in a social dilemma, they stop contributing. And if you optimize a mechanism on those bots, you get this policy here, which looks reasonable, you know, it's yellow where it should be yellow, it's blue where it should be blue, but it just hasn't honed in on the right idiosyncrasies. So although this task is quite simple, people still behave in a way that is like pretty specific. They have a lot of quirks in, what, in how they behave and what they want. Um, okay, so I was talking about that, this was about removing assumptions and removing like knowledge. We didn't want to assume how people behave or what they should want, but we still have slipped some assumptions in there by creating an initial data set where people were playing against a, a, a bunch of baselines. And also the agent had access to a baseline during training. So we now want to remove both of these things. And we want to say, let's start from scratch that we have no data and we have no idea how to solve this task. Because beforehand we said, uh, we don't know what the right answer is. There's, there's no ground truth here, but we have some ideas of what people might want and that we can like put online and gather some data on. So here we say, we don't know anything. We start from random and we only optimize from self-play. So we do not optimize against the baseline. Um, so here's what that looks like. Uh, you create a network with random weights, fixed, put it online, have it play against itself, and then ask people, did you like referee A or B? They don't realize it's the same policy because the games happen differently. Then we, have it, we model that data set, we distill that into LSTMs, populate the simulation, have the agent now play against itself and self-play, get a little bit better. That agent we deploy again online to play against itself, and we uh, append to that data to the data set that we have, make it bigger, model that, create, a rich, create another simulation, and just keep going around this loop. And we check if it converges, or we check if there are any cycles by having a meta game where all the mechanisms that we trained so far play against each other under the biggest uh, human model that we have until that point. And you can see it just gets better and better, but like, you know, it converges. And then once we feel it converges, we play against the liberal egalitarian baseline again. This is the first time this mechanism sees a baseline and we win again. And I think that was very surprising that that worked. Uh, it's even cooler when you see how the policy uh, evolved because this is the policy that we started with. So this is like um, 
the plot that I already explained, but like for all the different endowment conditions. And it is actually yellow where it should be blue and blue where it should be yellow. So the first random initialization did completely the opposite of what you should be doing. It gave people more if they contributed less. That's a terrible thing to try in this task. But still the data that we gathered was good enough, although it was just 300 people, it was a small data set. It was good enough in one step of optimization that this agent learns that up is up and down is down and you should give people more if they give, you should give them more back if they contribute more. And over the seven steps, it just like refines this policy until it looks pretty similar to what we had, uh, where we, uh, in the previous method, where we like build one big uh, model out of one big data set. Here, we have seven small data sets that actually add up to be much smaller than the original one. But we come up with a very, very similar solution. Um, so the benefits of this are we do not inject any domain knowledge and we use a lot less data. The reason for that is because it is sort of philosophically a bit more sophisticated. So you're not saying we're built one big model that tries to capture everything that humans could ever do. We're just saying we expect that people's policy will change as we put them in a different situation. So we just gather a little bit of human data, then we change what we do. And then we know people will act a little bit differently. So we gather a little bit more data from this policy and we like uh, iterate a couple of times. Um, so in conclusion, we demonstrate two pipelines uh, to train agents to help humans cooperate based on human preferences to create an AI that is shaped by the population that it interacts with. This agent learns to under award low contributions and to over award uh, players with low endowments to win elections. And I think by analyzing the policy, we also learned something new about what humans want. Like this was sort of a surprising solution, I think. Um, but there are important limitations. One is uh, voting by majority can disenfranchise minorities, which is why a lot of democracies have constitutions. Uh, and you can do something similar as the designer of the agent. For example, we made the choice that the agent doesn't have memory and we made the choice that it's a graph net that cannot distinguish the individual players. Um, these are like design choices you can still make. Uh, mechanisms should ideally be transparent and interpretable. Of course, in the real world, if they involve humans, they never are. But uh, here again, we've shown in this setting, you could analyze the policy. If you want like a complicated video game and you need a recurrent neural network to handle it, then it will get a lot harder. The, and the last one is of course, how much bias do you want to introduce? You could create an existing data set, in which case you inject a lot of your own knowledge or a lot of your assumptions on what possible solutions are. Or you could use an existing data set that already the world has produced, in which case, again, you are tied to the world that exists rather than the world that could be. If, however, you want to go, move away from that and say, let's reduce, let's have less domain knowledge and just start with uh, data with no data, then you have to experiment online. And that, of course, might not be safe or practical to just like gather data under policies that aren't necessarily good. Um, so just to uh, sum this up, and I think this connects a lot with uh, the previous talk, is the fact that this works hints at that it seems like human behavior and human preferences about this seem to lie on a smooth manifold that these sort of methods can handle. Um, and the question I'm really excited about is if you choose a more complicated setting, will these methods still work? Or do you need more sophisticated models of humans? Or do you need more sophisticated uh, methods of training your agent? Um, thank you. That is all I have. These are the papers that I mentioned. Awesome, thank you. Questions? Hi, uh, this was very interesting, very nice work. Um, I was wondering, were the participants uh, given any information about uh, who is the, making the decision for them? Or do you think it would be different if people would know or could choose between an AI um, or a human uh, that uh, will, separate, will make so the distribution? If you're the player, um, you will not know anything about how the policy is generated. So it's all, you have to experience it. And we're not telling anyone this is a baseline, this is an AI, this is a human. They know nothing. Mm -hmm. They're, we're just telling them this is referee A, referee B, that's it. 
And do you think that there will be a difference if people will, can choose between human or AI as a dist? Yeah, the... I specifically avoided that question. I think because we didn't want to uh, make it sort of about people's uh, notions that they bring into it. I, I couldn't, uh, I, I actually don't know which way it would go. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the real world, you, if you have to be concerned about that it is an AI, it would really matter to tell people. Yeah. Uh, and it depends on yeah whether they find that the potential for sort of more objectivity if they find that nice or the opposite. I, yeah. I, I could predict how it goes. Uh -huh. So, um, quick question, just to start it out. In one of the initial slides, you said that um, like there's some private information that isn't shared. Um, are players made aware of the wealth inequality among the other three players? Yeah, sorry. So uh, I think everything is transparent in the game. Like okay. The observations include uh, what everybody's balance were and how much they get. So that's completely transparent to everyone. Okay, so like someone who has two coins knows that there's another person who has 10. Okay, okay. Um, did you analyze, and if so, see any patterns in like voting based on if the human had 10 coins versus if they had two coins? Yeah, absolutely, so that was, I think, the first voting plot, which showed that like, a libertarian, which skips back proportionally, is actually very popular with any players. So most of the advantage that the agents had is by uh, appealing to the majority. Uh, yeah, that's that's definitely yeah. That's the biggest determinant of both, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, really amazing stuff. Uh, as probably one of the minority, I'm a behavioral scientist in the room, um, so I might ask questions that's stupid. So. Apologize in advance. Uh, I, I guess at the more higher level, uh, really appreciate that you start with very few assumptions about human preferences and try to recover that through uh, through uh, learning and interactions. But I'm just curious, uh, would existing data in behavioral science about trends in people's behavior, uh, behavior, behavior and preferences, obviously there's gonna be a large amount of individual differences. Do you think that's gonna be a helpful uh, inductive bias to build into the model instead of assuming for nothing? Maybe not. I mean, as you mentioned, that people probably tend to be uh, following a smooth manifold. Uh, so I, I'm just curious about your thought on that. I think it would be really awesome to start with a data set that contains many different paths and then to just uh, build a sort of a human model that would like not, because we just built one good model for one task. But I think actually using all the existing data and just building like a huge model that works for lots of different paths, that would be really, really cool. Uh, because you might also see benefits of generalization there. If the uh, uh, trained on a really big set of different tasks, you might be way better at generalizing to new situations and to new tasks. Here, it's all like within the right. tasks, right? There's a bit, but the biggest generalization we wanted to solve was it's like from one human data set to other humans. That was the biggest. And then we also actually generalized across endowment conditions. So, like, not all the endowment conditions that we test on are actually. But that's sort of an easy way of generalizing. I think from task to task would be amazing. And it could use data that already exists. Right. I think there are tons of data from behavioral science across different kinds of, either from economists or psychologists, that a meta-analysis might serve as a reasonable starting point for, uh, for maybe building a more generalized. Yeah, thanks. Um, so you mentioned one of the limitations is that um, that the system favors the majority and this could disenfranchise the minority. I'm curious if you have like any ideas about how to deal with this, um, like possibly like the voting system you use is based on popularity. Do you think maybe like choosing the winning, winning mechanism as the mechanism that is uh, like disagreed with the least as an alternative that could solve this? Yeah, I think there, there is. So the reason why I don't think it's a huge issue for this is because that's just how economic inequality works that uh, the, the more empowered people are the minority. So it's sort of about this conflict. Um, so I don't think it's an issue in this particular case. In general, I think a lot could be done to make what we just have as the vote, which is just a very quick binary choice between two experiences you had, to make that more meaningful. Like you could 
either ask people to just think about it longer, to do it on a longer time scale, to ask them after they have some time to think about it. You could also uh, give them a scenario where you tell them in the next episode, you don't know how many coins you're going to have. So the answer you need to give us needs to generalize to you maybe being in a different situation. And there are all sorts of framings that you could do to get a better um, measure of the thing you want to maximize. Because you could, if people aren't actually, if this expression of the vote is not actually capturing what we want to capture, then like it's optimizing for the wrong thing. So I think this is like definitely a big uh, area of improvement is to make this vote like more meaningful and capturing better what people want, especially long term. Super interesting, yeah. I guess uh, voting schemes on voting schemes. Um, okay, so let's thank uh, Raphael again for that awesome talk.